You're listening to Down to Earth, the Planet to Plate podcast, a co-production of the Radio Cafe and Kivira Coalition. I'm your host, Mary Charlotte Domandi. We've got a terrific program for you today about using regenerative agriculture to feed migrating wildlife, and in particular migrating birds, right here in New Mexico. That's right after two quick announcements. Please stay with us. Kivira's new agrarian program is accepting applications for the 2025 season from November 1st until December 15th. Apprenticeships take place on working ranches and farms practicing regenerative agriculture across the Intermountain West. These eight-month full-time paid apprenticeships include housing and will allow apprentices to be fully immersed in the work of an operation. Program support includes in-person gatherings, an education stipend, educational Zoom calls, one-on-one check-ins, and networking opportunities to kickstart a career in regenerative agriculture. Apprenticeships begin in March-April and run through November. You can learn more at kiviracoalition.org slash newagrarian. High Country News is a nonprofit, reader-supported publication that has been covering the West's land and communities for more than 50 years. Go to hcn.org slash trial to get two print issues and 60 days of digital access to all of HCN's reporting for free. That's hcn.org slash trial. And now to our program. We're talking today to Don Boyd. He's manager of the BEAM project. BEAM stands for Biologically Enhanced Agricultural Management at the Bosque del Apache National Wildlife Refuge, which is on the Rio Grande in central New Mexico. Let me just tell you a little bit about the Bosque del Apache. The refuge is a wetland that serves as a kind of oasis for many thousands of migrating waterfowl each year, including sandhill cranes, geese, ducks, and many other birds and mammals as well. It's an incredibly beautiful place. I've been there a number of times. It's indescribable. You're gonna, you, we'll link you to some of the photographs of, of this place. It draws people from all over the world, birders and photographers and artists and pretty much anybody who wants to see this kind of beauty and wildlife in a desert wetland. Anyway, the BEAM Project is a five-year initiative that was started last year, and it's all about converting about 38 acres on the refuge from conventional to regenerative farming. The goal is to bring back damaged land from failed agricultural plantings and invasive plant species and restore the land to health so that it can grow a variety of foods for the wildlife on the refuge. The project is also about making the land more resilient in times of drought and weather instability so that the land really can serve as a model and educational space for healthy agriculture in a desert climate. The initiative is sponsored by a nonprofit called Friends of the Bosque del Apache, and they brought on Don Boyd to manage the project. We're also joined on the podcast by molecular biologist and soil scientist Dave Johnson, who's a friend of the program. We've talked to him a number of times, and he's working with beam systems all over the world. And Wee Chun Sue Johnson, she's David's wife and partner in research and outreach and is co-creator of the Johnson Sue Bioreactor, a composting system for farming operations. Welcome, everybody, to Down to Earth. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So, Don, first of all, tell us about the Wildlife Refuge. I mean, what's it like there? What do you see at different times of year? You know, first of all, Bosque del Apache National Wildlife Refuge is one of the last few riparian areas along the Rio Grande River in in New Mexico. And that's really important because it gives birds in the flyway a place to either hang out in during the winter It's the southernmost range for some of the birds, the snow geese and sandhill cranes. And it's a stopover for a lot of other birds as as well. Uh, We have a really uh, exciting spring migration when there are warblers and flycatchers, along with shorebirds and wading birds come through white pelicans on their way to southern points in Mexico. So it's just a gorgeous place. And of course, there's wildlife year round, mountain lions, uh, even black bears, bobcats, and a lot of other smaller mammals. It's just a really exciting place to be. So part of the work of the refuge, and this is what we're here to talk about, 
is not only to give the birds a place to land when they're migrating, but also to make sure that they have food to eat. And that's what the agricultural fields on the Bosque are for. What was happening in those fields that made the folks at the refuge see a need for a new regenerative approach to growing there? Yeah, I think that's a, uh, I can give you an overview and David can give you the specifics based on the soil analysis he did when we first started this project. But basically in the fields that we're working in, they attempted to grow corn two successive years and the crops failed. It's a testament to how poor the quality, the nutrient quality is in the fields. What we saw was very compacted soils, very little biology and very weedy. So it was very difficult to grow the crops. They were putting a lot of inputs in there, synthetic, both nitrogen, herbicides, pesticides. They were basically farming conventionally and it was not economically viable with the budget that they had there. Don, what was growing in those fields before? I mean, they tried twice for two successive years to grow corn, but the bosque has been there for many, many years. What was going on in those same fields before that? Well, I think before then they had tried to grow other cereal grains, milo, triticale, things like that. As you probably know, to grow corn, it's a very water-intensive process. And water has become an increasingly important commodity in, in New Mexico, as it has been in most of the Southwest. The, the amount of inputs in terms of fertilizer, pesticides, insecticides, herbicides, whatever, that cost continues to go up. So it's a self-defeating spiraling circle. The more amendments you put into it, the more you need to put into it to get a similar size crop until you reach a point where it's, no matter what you do, it's really not going to produce anything anymore. So David, what kinds of changes are you undertaking with this BEAM project? And by the way, BEAM, I've never heard that acronym before. Is that, did that come from you or is that a thing or both? We're looking at the soils from a different perspective. We're looking at it from the soil microbiome viewpoint. Often the soil microbiome is neglected in farming. It just isn't in their picture when they're trying to figure out how to grow a better crop. Right, right. When we look at this, it's from a system approach. BEAM is biologically enhanced agriculture management. So you enhance it by bringing back in the microbiomes that is so desperately needed in the soil to help the plants and, and to help the whole system. So, David, what kind of changes are you undertaking with this BEAM project, and how are you envisioning that whole transition? I mean, this is a, you know, going from A to B doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't even happen from one season to the next. No, it, it does take a little while to, to rebuild that community. We start out, we inoculate the soil with a compost from what we make from a Johnson Sioux composter. It's a, it's a one-year process. It's built at the very beginning. You never disturb it from that point forward. You keep it at 70% moisture content and aerobic through the whole process. It's, it's never turned. And it results in basically a vermicompost product. And we're finding that that applied at about two pounds per acre, which is a dusting at best. We, we apply it in the furrow at planting. And it brings that biology back into the system. And then along with that, we do cover crops in the winter. That helps feed the microbes during the winter, and also it creates ground cover in the spring. When you roll it down, it keeps the weeds at bay. And then you can plant right over it, right into the soil with your commodity crop. And we also do an inoculation at that point as well. So we're seeing soils build up year after year, uh, increasing productivity from year to year as far as the amount of uh, plant biomass that you can grow above the soil. We see a dramatic change in the soil carbon. We're rebuilding it at a significant rate in some of the other projects that we have going. And also we bring back nitrogen into the soil. What comes with the carbon is, is a stable nitrogen, a nitrogen that's tied up biologically. And it doesn't volatilize to the atmosphere and it doesn't leach down into the water table. It stays there and it becomes available when you have that community there to recycle it. And so that has really great implications for the health of the waterways 
in this riparian system? Well, so many things that it helps with health and it, it actually creates a better condition for plants to grow. They can pick up elemental nutrients when that soil microbiome is functional that they can't in regular fertilized conventional systems. Yeah. I imagine, Mary Charlotte, one of the things you're real aware of is the impact of runoff from agrarian practices. So because the soil is holding more water, and David, correct me if this is incorrect, but for every 1% additional increase in carbon in the soil, uh, it will hold 50,000 gallons of water per acre. Yes. So what you're doing is you're sequestering the water in the soil, so it's less likely to run off. And because you're not using synthetic fertilizers, insecticides, pesticides, et cetera, you're not causing algae blooms downriver, so to speak. And you're not negatively impacting the drinking water that's become a part of the aquifer. And as well, the insecticides and herbicides are not in that system as well. They don't flow in, down into the, the water table or also the food that the birds eat. It's a much healthier food for them. And because we are advocating the no-till system in this practice as well, it provides the habitat for a lot of beneficial insects and animals, and that by itself provides extra food for the birds. Well, that's something I wanted to ask you about, because the, the diet of migrating birds is varied. They don't just have like a plant-based diet. Tell us what else, Hui Chun, that they like to eat, and how do these practices really elevate that food supply? Full disclosure, I don't study birds, but based on all the literatures I've been reading, it sounds like, at least for crane, they love crustaceans. They love small, like lizards and different animals. And they will eat corn, they will eat grains and fresh sprout plants. So their diet is not just corn or grain. And that less chemical in their system will provide them a much healthier bird population as well. Right. So the idea that if, if birds are eating healthier food that's not tainted with chemicals, they'll be healthier, their offspring will be healthier, and then the whole system, because you're we're looking at it from a holistic perspective, and they're part of the, the planetary ecosystem. And you're seeing all three of our heads bounce up and down like we're on <laughs> something on a car dashboard. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you don't have the video, but I do, and it's all true. David and Don, how do you choose the cover crops? Are they also potential food for the wildlife, or are they primarily there to um, do soil restoration, and then you plant the food crops a little down the road when the fields are in better shape? The plants automatically create more seed. We're using a lot of vetches, peas, bell beans for a winter cover crop. And we, we pick crops that we know that when we roll them down in the spring, they'll stay down. We let them get to a certain maturity, uh, about 50% blossom or more. And those do provide food for the, the birds as well. And then the summer crops are usually grain crops, so milo, corn. We do mixtures. We know that their diet needs to be different. And also the effect that these multi-species plants have on the soil microbiome as well. And creating more diversity in that region is, is what we're shooting for. One of the challenges that David and Hui Chen have ta taken on in doing this project on a national wildlife refuge is that the outcomes, expected outcomes, are a little different than they are, say, in farming. In farming, in the fall, you're going to harvest the crop, and that's it. At the refuge, you want things on there for the birds longer, clear through the winter, so the birds have food through the winter. So the challenge for us is how to figure out how to do that in a responsible way. So as David is, is suggesting, you have different spring cover crops, multi-species cover crops, than you do for the fall cover crops that you're planting. So next week, we will be planting the fall cover crop, and I think it's seven different seeds. Very interesting. Don, did you have to get any new equipment? I mean, I know that the whole thing of regenerative agriculture is less and less tech heavy and more and more farming with nature. But what does that look like right now? Yeah, the two biggest equipment changes we've had to make. One is 
through David and Cruz's creatives, we have the loan of a no-till drill. So this is a piece of machinery you drag behind the roll behind the, the tractor. And in a single pass, it creates a shallow furrow about half inch or an inch. The seed goes in. The liquid biology that David has talked about goes in on that. And then the furrow is covered. And all that's done into uh, the existing crop that's there in the field. The second thing that the friends had to purchase was a roller crimper. So a roller crimper, again, is cold, pulled behind the tractor once the crop is ready to come down. And instead of cutting it, it breaks it and runs it parallel to the surface of the field. This helps prevent transpiration from water into the atmosphere. It creates a healthier biome for insects that are down close to the ground. And it provides cover for the crop that was just planted until it gets tall enough and strong enough then to start growing more on its own. So those are two very significant piece tools that we've had to add. And also it cools the ground. Yes, right. Yeah, keeps it cooler or keeps it warmer in the winter. Right. And it yeah. provides food for the soil microbiome with yeah. all that plant matter near the soil surface and the moisture content, the fungi start to break it down, bacteria come and they start to feed on it. It's, it's a whole system rebuilding, recycling everything. This is a project that has the potential to benefit not only the refuge and its wildlife, but also the farmers in the surrounding valley. How does that work? Tell us about that. Well, based on what I understand from the friends, they are really passionate about helping the refuge to be a good neighbor for the valley. And there are a lot of farmers in the valley. They are mostly conventional. And so in the refuge, if they are able to successfully implement bean practice and transition to regenerative, then it becomes the example for the valley. And when they are able to feed the birds, the birds will stay on the refuge so they don't go out there. It doesn't mean it's 100%. They won't go out to other farmers' land to eat the crop, but it will be less likely if they are plentiful of food on the refuge. So right now the, the birds are going because the, the fields aren't working at the bosque, they're going to the neighboring farmers, and the farmers are like, oh, those darn birds, or whatever. They're a bit of a nuisance? Is that is that really happening? It can be. Up and down the Rio Grande Valley, there are other refuge, and they feed the birds, too, with their production. But if all this entities able to do a better job of producing better food, healthier food for the birds then it will provide a much healthier relationship with their neighbors. Because the birds probably like the refuge. So if they can eat there, then there's then they'll stay there. Yeah. I mean, they have the water. Just like human, if they're plentiful of a good job and good places to eat and nice habitat, then we will stay there too. Right. Is there any movement on the part of farmers or any interest in regenerative agriculture so far? Or the hope is that maybe this will get people interested? Yeah, one of the challenges in having this technology adopted is that most of the farmers, in, at least in the middle Rio Grande Valley, are relatively small farmers. They grow chilies and some corn and, and some other things. There doesn't seem to be a union of farmers in a sense. Uh, my sense is they don't talk to each other a lot in, in social groups. So we have done some outreach. Uh, we In July, we had David and Hui Chin come in and talk about the whole process. Then we had the New Mexico Department of Agriculture's Healthy Soil Program speakers come in and talk about how they can provide financial assistance and technical assistance for farmers that are looking to make the transition between conventional and regenerative agricultural practices. We had Socorro Soil and Water Conservation District, uh, NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service come in. And all of these people are trying to do the same thing, make it easier for farmers and ranchers to convert from conventional farming practices to regenerative agriculture practices. It is a slow process. 
So that's why on the Friends of Boski Del Apache's website, we have an event section where we talk about what's going on with the regenerative agricultural process. We want to keep people informed so that over the years they can see that it's making a difference. That's when people will really start to sign on and ask a lot of serious questions about how they can make that transition. It's a little frustrating sometimes that uh, growing crops is a seasonal thing. It's not an overnight success. So we have to be patient with the process and just keep doing outreach. And that's that's what the Friends of Bosque del Apache is focusing on. Well, and yeah, and as a couple of years go by and there's more to show for it, the yes. inspiration piece will be there. Yes. And I'd, yeah. I'd have to add that when, once a farmer gets this, they are so happy with it. They're making YouTube videos everywhere and getting them out. These guys are amazing once they get this going and see how much it can help their process. Going back for a moment to the issue of water and the Bosque doing their part to have clean water in that part of the state, does the Bosque del Apache play a significant role in the water cycle of central New Mexico? If you talk to farmers in the area, they might suggest that Bosque del Apache is taking water that they could otherwise use. The Rio Grande River is often dried up now by spring. So unless they release water from dams farther upstream or they start to pump water, they may not have a water to do the things that they're supposed to do to help wildlife. So the challenge for the refuge, as it is for area farmers and ranchers, is to be able to do the same or more with less water. That's one of the reasons regenerative agriculture is so important to the refuge, is that it proposes to use less water in the long run, especially once it gets established, than you do using conventional farming techniques. We have a hydrologist on the board of the Friends of Bosque del Apache. He pays a lot of attention to water issues. Now we have an intern from New Mexico Tech who is measuring how much water comes into the refuge and what happens to that water. The water that comes into the refuge flows out to the refuge back into what's called the low flow conveyance channel, which by court decree, New Mexico is required to release a certain amount of water downstream to Texas and Mexico every year. And increasingly, that is more and more difficult because there is less water to release downstream. So water is probably the single most important, uh, certainly natural resource issue facing the state of, of New Mexico. I think if more people can practice regenerative agriculture, and their soil are more receptive to receive the water and hold on to the water, then we can recharge the aquifer. And that water cycle can become more positive in its own feedback loop. Don, you did your own year of refuge on the refuge. You not only work in agriculture, but you're an artist. And I must say, an incredible artist. Listeners can go to donboyd.com to see the work and read the blog about your year of refuge. Tell us a little bit about what that year was like and whether it affected you in terms of like seeing the need for change and regeneration on the refuge. Wow, what a question. You know, uh, let me start with the with the big picture. I think my spending every day for a year from 2021 to 2022 photographing at Bosque del Apache made me receptive to the message I later heard from David and Wei Chen when they spoke at the annual Festival of the Cranes. And my whole thing, thing about refuge is what is refuge to us as humans against the backdrop of a national wildlife refuge. So I became much more intimate with the birds and the plant life on the refuge and had more questions than I ever had answers about, about what's the relationship? Why do these plants grow here next to each other? In a sense, what I discovered that every plant that's at the refuge was there because they were voted in by every other plant, except for those plants that were introduced by humans and happenstance. So uh, it left me open thinking about what is refuge really about and how do we continually heal the place? 
because when I ask people, why do you come to the refuge? People, you know, it's one, it's on a lot of people's bucket list, not just photographers, but people who find out that it has one of the highest rates of bird population in terms of species density of any refuge in the world. Why do they come here? And more often than not, what I hear is something to the effect of it feeds my soul. So what does that really mean? I mean, you know, if you ask people questions like that, or if you're out there on a January morning and 3,000 snow geese get up at one time and fly right over your head, so dense that you can feel the pressure from their wings on your body, and people all of a sudden become instant, intimate friends, even though the person on your left you've never seen before in your life. There's something about awe and beauty that really connects us. And refuge is part of that experience. So when I heard David and Wei Chen talk, I realized what they were doing was what I'm really interested in is how do we heal the earth? Their focus is on how do we heal the soil? And I, that's certainly a, a large part of the earth. So when we look at what's going on at the refuge, it's really connecting people to each other through wildlife. And that's why it's it's so important to me. And with somebody with zero agriculture background and very little knowledge about of how food is produced, to suddenly be interested in being the project manager for a regenerative agriculture project, that's what the whole thing is about. It's about healing. It's about beauty. It's about awe. It's about learning what our relationship is to these things that don't have a voice for themselves. And regenerative agriculture is that process. It takes us away from the destructive practices we have been using for the last several hundred years and moves us back into a place of being stewards for the health of the planet. And I, I love that you are drawing that connection between restoring the soul and restoring the soil, restoring the self and restoring the land around us, because that is part of the holistic perspective. It's not just like a, a cookie cutter prescription that you can put out there. It's like, okay, you need a roller cripper, you need a seed drill, you need this, you need that. It's a real connection of, as the Buddhists say, sentient beings. Yes. And these, these social times, I mean, I, you know, I'm not so naive to think that we haven't had challenges similar to this in different ways in, in human history. But right now, I think a lot of people are looking to understand better what their role is in relation to everything else. And one of the things that made the most sense to me was something that um, Jonas Salk did, the scientist who discovered polio vaccine. He suggested that one of the questions we're trying to answer is, how do we be good, good ancestors? And so if you really think about that question, that it leads you to a place of saying, is what I'm doing being a good ancestor? It's not about ego. It's actually about connection. And he also said that nature and what we're doing, we are the first humans to be co-creators of our reality. And so our part in that is to say, is what we're doing making a difference? And I think that's why what David and Wei, Wei Chen are doing is so important. They're giving people hope. We showed the film Common Ground here back in July, a couple of days before David and Wei Chen came down and spoke. And I've had people talk to me and say things like, you know, it's the first time I've had hope in a long time. When you can see that you can help restore soil health that leads to better food nutrition, less labor, less pesticide, all those kinds of things. It makes a huge difference to people's sense of, is there a future for me and my offspring in this planet? I just want to say also, wildlife refuges are in themselves this incredibly important thing dotted across our country. And they're inc they're wildly underfunded and understaffed all across the country. And it's something for citizens to really think about, to visit, to support, and also to encourage our elected officials to support. And kudos to the staff at the Bosque del Apache Wildlife Refuge who are doing the work on this project. Yeah, let me, let me add to that. Uh, and I really appreciate that acknowledgement of the challenges that face the refuge. 
This project has been so important to the friends of Bosque del Apache that they and their 12,000 member strong or organization are funding this research piece. Even to the point now we have hired a farmer to separately work just on this project to make sure that things happen when they need to happen and that the soil gets treated the way that it needs to be treated in order for this project to be successful. David, you and Hui Chun also have your hand in many other projects. Besides this refuge, you're working on all kinds of other things, including a project in Turkey, where you're doing regenerative agriculture projects there. What's happening? How did you get involved with it? What does it look like? Um, it's a project that we got with uh, Stella McCartney and a cotton organization, Soktus, in Turkey. Their objectives were to fulfill the UN requirements of 45% reduction in their carbon emissions in cotton production system. 45%, that's no joke. Yeah, they're, they're serious about it. And we just happened to, the connections pulled us over into Turkey. We went over there one time. We showed them how to make the bioreactor. We showed them what they needed to do as far as planting. They didn't have the equipment and they couldn't get the equipment. It just wasn't available in Turkey. So they made the equipment. (laughs) And we've been working with them about five years now. And we see a dramatic change. They have uh, really adopted this. Uh, They liked it so well that they've increased the area that they farmed cotton by 10 times. And they've got about 2,000 hectares in Romania and are adopting the bean management on that as well. So they're growing sunflower and grain crops in Romania. But their their cotton crop has done so well and they're able to reduce their time in the field. You asked about equipment and actually you don't need as large of tractors to do this. They reduced their time in the field 65% as far as tractor time. Wow. They really liked that. (laughs) Yeah. Before they get involved with this, they will have 26 trips on that field during that growing season and now reduced down to four trips. Imagining the amount of diesel that they save, the personnel time and the maintenance on those equipments. And they reduce the herbicide down to zero because growing the cover crop and no-till practice, they reduce the, the wheat pressure and they reduce the pesticide by 56%. And keep it in mind that this research field is like a little island in the midst of the huge conventionally grown cotton region. Another very important part I want to tie into the water issue. We ran into a severe drought in Turkey. So the government cut their water allotment by one third. So we were only able to utilize two thirds of the original water, yet we were able to produce the same amount of crop with a two-third of water allotment. So using less water, getting herbicides down to nothing, pesticides cut way down. And David, how is the soil doing? Like when you when you take measurements, what's that looking like? Well, they've increased uh, the soil carbon. They've been increasing soil carbon at 6.6 tons of carbon per hectare per year. They're, remember, the original was to cut their... Uh, emissions by 45%. We covered all of that. We covered all the carbon in the harvesting, in the making of the thread, in the weaving of the cloth, and all the disposal of the waste from all those as well. So, and then had another about eight tons of carbon total in this system, extra as far as offsetting carbon emissions. So that's a success story on every dimension. Yes, and, and nitrogen, um, normally farmers have to apply about 180 to 200 pounds of nitrogen per hectare per year. We were bringing in 590 pounds of nitrogen per hectare per year and fulfilling the nitrogen demand of the plant as well. So, and, and that nitrogen is, is very expensive. That's about $1,500 of nitrogen per hectare per year or, or a about $700 per acre of nitrogen that you're putting back into the system 
that you don't have to apply synthetic nitrogen. Are you using your Johnson Sioux bioreactor? Yes, yes. They they built a bioreactor. We went over and looked at it. Everything was good. They, they had it nailed, did the applications. They're still doing the applications. I wish you could see the farmer's face. They have not seen the biodiversity that's way back when they were children. They were so excited about finding earthworms, finding life in your soil, on your farm. They remembered it as kids, that they used to go behind the plow and walk, walking as kids, and they would see the worms and they would pick them. They said they hadn't seen worms since they, after, so shortly after. And when they did the analysis at the start, there were zero worms per square meter. There's now over 100 worms per square meter. And the normal for those soils is about 35. So they're about three times more. They brought back the biology that well in that system. And of course, worms are really good for the soil. Well, what we're applying is a vermicompost. So once you build a worm population up, it'll be able to sustain itself. You won't have to do the inoculations. They'll be doing it in place for you. So the worms are still there underground, but they were like sleeping and then the, the regenerative practices reactivated them so they could come to the surface? They bring, well, once you have food resources for them, they come up and feed. And then yeah. if you don't disturb the soil like this, this management protocol requires, you don't do any ripping or disking or plowing in this. That's what really destroys their communities. Don, what are your ultimate hopes for this project? And what is your role going forward? Basically, uh, my role as project manager has two, two goals. One is to assist, mainly through communication, this project be successful. So we demonstrate that regenerative agricultural practices work well on national wildlife refuges or any federal reservation. And two, that we're able to disseminate the information with validity to area farmers. Area could be people up and down the middle Rio Grande Valley or in the whole state of New Mexico. And my role between now and the, uh, we are just about to start year two with the planting next week. So this is a five year research project is that through these five years, we increasingly bring attention to the success that we're having or to the challenges we're having so we can deal with those challenges so other people don't have to. So that's that's my goal. I'm really excited about it still. And it's been a pleasure working with David and Wei Chen, who are obviously very knowledgeable and experienced around the world in how to make this stuff work. And David, when when the five-year period is done, what kind of, I mean, in best case scenario, what kind of maintenance are these fields going to still need? Well, they need to continue the, the beam process. So looking at this soil from a biological perspective, just realizing as they farm it, they need to consider all these other organisms that are there so that they can be functional. And to what extent will there be a self-sustaining element to it? And to what extent do we have to keep applying, for example, compost and, and planting and all that kind of stuff? Well, we see that would probably come to an end as you reach a certain stage in the soil a certain balance. We see a fungal to bacterial ratio is a very rough measure of the health of that soil. And we're seeing as you get a higher fungal to bacterial ratio, you do see that the fertility is is brought back. We also saw that in the grazing management, uh, adapted multi-paddock grazing project that we were on. We saw that the farmers that had been using the AMP systems for 20 to 30 years, you know, they had a very healthy soil. It had a very representative fungal bacterial ratio. It had a good protozoa ratio as well. So it's once you build these systems up, if you just don't start to destroy them with the plowing and disking and fertilizers and herbicides and pesticides, they will maintain themselves. It's, it's an elegant system that nature has. It's just that we have to restore it into our agroecosystems. And it's it can be done. We see it, it. If it can be done in cotton, it's probably one of the toughest crops. It uses the most fertilizer. It has more herbicides and pesticides than any other crop on the planet. 
and they are very successful now at implementing a beam approach into their cotton management. And we see it in corn. We have farmers that have done it in corn in middle America. And we occasionally get these emails from people that says, you know, this, this saved my farm. And it's quite ugly. Yeah, I mean, it, let me uh, piggyback on something you said earlier about the challenges that National Wildlife Refuge face in terms of budgets. At the end of five years, we can demonstrate that this project is successful. If the friends choose to bow out and no longer pay for the services of a farmer and stuff, at this point, it is not clear that the refuge is going to be able to continue to do those things themselves. We certainly hope so, but if budgets continue to be attacked or lessened in the coming years, it will be increasingly difficult. And one of the challenges is, is how you retain and attract competent people to the National Wildlife Refuge Service. And to that end, they are fortunately continuing to raise salaries of staff, but those salaries aren't money that is added onto the budget, it's money that comes out of the existing budget. So with every salary increase, the effective budgets of re refuges are actually dropping. And they're at points now where there are several positions at Bosque del Apache that cannot be fulfilled because they don't have the budget for it. And it's not, I'm sure it's not just our region in the Southwest, I'm sure it's refuge system nationwide. So as you said, we need to be talking to our representatives in Congress, in the Senate, <laughs> and even the president, and talking about what we need to do. Uh, just as a footnote, Bosque del Apache provides over $14 million annually to income in Socorro County. Their budget is less than $2 million. So if you do something that results in this refuge having to limp along or even be closed, you're really going to hurt the economy of the surrounding area. Anything else you want to talk about before we go? I think of regenerative agriculture as the hub in a wheel with a lot of spokes. It sequesters water in the soil. And by the end of our project, we will have sequestered tons of airborne carbon out of the air. It's something, it's not just the carbon that's emitted now, it's carbon in the air that would have been there for decades, if not centuries, is going back into the ground. If everybody used regenerative agriculture processes, we could probably pull all of the airborne carbon out of the air that we wanted to. Don Boyd is project manager of the BEAM program, Biologically Enhanced Agricultural Management at the Bosque del Apache National Wildlife Refuge. David Johnson is a molecular biologist specializing in regenerative agriculture. Hui Chun Su Johnson is his wife, research assistant, and co creator of the Johnson Su Bioreactor. Thank you all so much for being with us on Down to Earth. Thank you, Mary Thank, Thank you so much. If you want to find out more about the refuge, you can go to friendsofbosquedelapache.org, and Bosque is spelled B-O-S-Q-U-E, and we'll put that in the show notes. And if you want to see Don Boyd's amazing photography, you can go to Don Boyd, B-O-Y-D, donboyd.com, or facebook.com slash photography. You've been listening to Down to Earth. We would love it if you would support this program, which you can do by going to patreon.com slash down to earth planet to plate, where you can sign up for as little as $3. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And also please rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. The Kivira Coalition is a not-for-profit and a community network of ranchers, farmers, conservationists, scientists, educators, and many others dedicated to regenerative practices that produce healthy food, support meaningful livelihoods, sustain biodiversity, and remedy the impacts of climate change. To learn more about Kivira and how you can support their work, visit kiviracoalition.org, Q-U-I-V-I-R-A. And finally, this show is a production with the Radio Cafe. You can check out radiocafe.org to hear back episodes of this show and also find all kinds of other shows on a wide variety of topics as well. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.